everybody, and welcome to Discourse for February 2022. I think I got that date right. I'm Candace Mixon, and I'll be hosting our Discourse today, and I'm here with Craig Martin and Suzanne Owen. Um, I am a visiting assistant professor at Occidental College. I'm in the Department of Religious Studies, and I work and research on Islamic studies and material culture of religion. So before we get started with our deep dive into religion and the news this month, I'd love to let our guests introduce themselves. So maybe Craig, take it away. Hi, I'm Craig Martin. Um, I'm a professor of religious studies at St. Thomas Aquinas College in New York. Um, I study discourse analysis and ideology critique and method and theory in the study of religion type of stuff. Uh, my most recent book, which I was I was interviewed about it on the RSP recently, my most recent book is Discourse and Ideology, a Critique of the Study of Culture, um, which I'm pretty excited about to see it finally come out after so long. Yeah, definitely. It's already gotten a lot of buzz, which is amazing to to have the the pre buzz. <laughs> and Suzanne, yes, I'm Suzanne Owen, reader in religious studies at Leeds Trinity University in the UK, and I wrote a blurb for Craig on his book, I think. <laughs> and um, and I research indigenous religious traditions and um, contemporary British Druidry, um, particularly indigeneity discourses, also in Newfoundland. Awesome. Well, thanks. So we'll each kind of bring up an um, article and an issue that we're thinking about um, and then give us a chance to to chat about it. So the kind of thing that a few of us were interested in was the recent issue of Reverend Andres Arango in the Diocese of Phoenix, who has just resigned from his post or retired from his post as a priest on account of doing baptisms incorrectly. So the issue was that around June 17th, any any baptisms that he did after June 17th, he, he rectified the wording that he used. But prior to that, all baptisms were deemed invalid. And the issue came down to the fact that he, for many, many, many years, had been saying, we baptize you instead of I baptize you. And this was deemed not correct as far as what one is supposed to say in terms of how one performs a baptism. Therefore, there are many issues that, that came up with this. One of them being that if the first sacrament of baptism, which is the first sacrament in Catholicism, is invalid, that then invalidates the subsequent baptism. So if one has then had first communion, you know, confirmation, marriage even, many of those rites may need to be reperformed, including baptism. If Instead, uh, the same priest, let's say, didn't baptize you, but gave you a later sacrament. Then that later sacrament, there was n no, no issues found with the later sacraments. So I thought that this was uh, really interesting, mainly because a lot of the responses in the article I read on it and also in the diocese website have mentioned that it may seem legalistic, but the words that are spoken, sacramental form, along with the action that are performed and the materials used, the sacramental matter, are crucial. And they, the diocese gave the example that if, for example, a, um, a priest gave you know, milk instead of wine during communion, it would not perform the transubstantiation to become the blood of Christ, that milk mattered or that milk versus wine was an important distinction. And then one could just not be substituted for the other. The other questions that I was thinking about were in terms of who's speaking. So in terms of we, are you, are you performing the baptism on behalf of the church, which is not quite correct versus I, in terms of sort of performing it in, in Christ's name. And then the other question I had was just thinking about language in general. So thinking about any idiosyncrasies of the English language, perhaps versus other languages that sacral rites might be performed in. So those are just kind of some of the issues I was thinking of here. I'm curious, you know, since we had lots of thoughts on it, it was so, so fascinating. Perhaps Craig or Suzanne, you have something to, to offer here. I think, what I found most fascinating about it was how it apparently seemed to enrage people in my Facebook feed. No, not en enrage is an overstatement, but my Facebook feed was flooded with posts about this. And some people seemed like how why why changing one word doesn't matter. 
and I was, my thought was that kind of presumes that people don't take their religion seriously in some ways. Like some people really do mean what they say when they say we believe X, Y, and Z. And if you don't say it just the right way, you're one of them. It uh, kind of assumes that everybody must wear their religion as lightly as you do, I guess, to assume that these details don't matter. Uh, and I also thought of like the longstanding, you know, the, the terminology that we use to talk about orthopraxy and orthodoxy. Like perhaps this community is very emphasis, you know, their, their emphasis is on orthopraxy and those things matter. And uh, yeah, so I guess that the, the shocked response shocked me more than the fact that some Catholics might be really upset about this. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on your end, uh, Susan? Like, I think it's one that um, I, I didn't know that how important words were, I guess, in this case. And I know that they can be very important in other religious traditions that I've looked at. And I do also wonder that are they making a case here, but are they overlooking transgressions elsewhere? So that would be an interesting sort of comparison. Like, is there a power issue here with this priest being out of line or something. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, I had the same thought myself. I wonder if this is the culmination of a long-standing beef with this particular priest, and they use this as an excuse to finally get him out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, that's pure speculation on my part, but it's a question that I can't had. You know, that was what came to me. Like, what is it about this case? You know, that made them, you know, rigid with the application of their rules for the sacrament. Yeah, I was thinking about it. So in terms of the the outrage part, though, I think that a part that I haven't seen kind of mention as much, and this was also on the diocese website that they that they quoted St. Thomas of Aquinas, the same of the same of uh, Craig's school. Um, so they quoted, um, a you know, a sort of a statement from from them. And they said, uh, God bound himself to the sacrament, but is not bound by the sacrament and that God could then enact grace. So I thought that this was an interesting part that hadn't gotten mentioned because everything I saw in the media about it was like, everyone needs to go and get rebaptized like right this second and, you know, fill out this form and like, you know, do this thing if you think that you've been baptized by this person. But they did mention that, you know, they don't want to rely on it, but they said that, you know, it is definitely possible that maybe God doesn't care that much, <laughs> you know, not so many right. words. And so I think that that's kind of interesting, too, to think about the opportunities for that. And but, you know, I think more broadly, it it does help us think about the presentation of and this get back to your outrage question, you know, the presentations of any type of religious practice as, you know, backwardsly rigid or sort of so concerned with this. And I, I see this. How legalistic. dare they take it that seriously? <laughs> yeah. And so we see these legalistic, you know, sort of opinions or, or pushback against legalism in all sorts of traditions within Islam, within my you know field of study. You know, I see this all the time of like, you know, that there's this insistence on the law and that is what gives a religion sometimes a bad rap is that they're so legalistic. And so I feel like this is another chance to undercut a tradition for, as you say, daring to follow its own rules, you know? So I think that that's kind of a curious situation too. I mean, I, I mean, I, and as if we are not legalistic when we see plagiarism in our classes, right? <laughs> that <laughs> we're all legalistic about some things. Uh, we, we may be differently legalistic, but there are some things that we draw hard lines on and, mm. uh, you know, students get reported to the administration for not putting quotation marks in the right place. I mean, I, I hope most yeah. are a little generous with their policing of those things, but it makes sense that people do take certain rules seriously. I guess it's also an interesting question about what is valid um, and how do you know? Um, you mentioned about does the God care? Well, you know, does the church know when something is valid or invalid when the sacrament has been performed you know like sometimes they allow extraordinary circumstances you know for like sacraments of death on the battlefield or something and it, it, you know i'm sure there's lots of irregularities that might happen in such cases and so there is this leeway for exception um, extraordinary you know exceptions 
and um, presumably because it's the intention that matters, perhaps. But yeah, so it's like it's when it's inconsistent. I think this is where it's quite interesting, in my view. I wonder, uh, man. I want to know so much more information about this, right? There's only so much information available right now on the web. Um, I would love to go to Phoenix and interview these people um, to get more information. But like you said, on the website, there's mention of grace. I wonder if they do intend for people to go back and redo all the rights, but they're holding out like the possibility that maybe grandma died before she had a chance to go back and, and redo the rights so that for that reason, we don't want those people to end up in hell. I don't know. I, I wonder if that's the reason for their qualification about grace, because some people may be beyond, uh, maybe beyond yeah. redoing the rights. They can't, they can't do it again because they're not here <laughs> anymore. Well, the good news is the diocese uh, let everyone know that they don't need to go to confession. There is no need to go to confession for this particular situation. You yourself as a baby or as a small child do not need to be forgiven for this, at least at this moment. So we can at least have have some peace in that. Um, well, anyways, uh, you know, while we're sort of talking about religion in America and, uh, and thinking of those issues, Craig, I know you had brought up some great, great issues related to kind of religious freedom in, in the United States. So perhaps take those away with those issues that you brought up. Yeah. So the political, public and legal battles about the definition of religion and the extent to which we're going to offer exemptions for quote unquote religious organizations continue. I mean, I, arguably they never abated in America. A few years ago, we saw a story about cake maker who refused to make a cake for a gay couple. And honestly, I should have looked it up. I can't remember how the Supreme Court ruled on that, but it looks like there is a similar case that the Supreme Court in the U.S. has agreed to to review. And it's similar in that it's a private provider of services, somebody who creates websites for customers and I guess they have said that they want to continue to make websites. They don't have a problem making websites for LGBTQ plus individuals, but they want to refuse. They want to hang on to the right to refuse to make wedding websites for gay couples. So they're, they're like, we will serve gay couples. We just won't serve you by making a website for your wedding. And uh, I mean, the Supreme Court in the U.S. has just been fascinating to watch over the last couple of years, given the, the dramatic shift towards the right on the court, given President Trump's appointees. This, th I would not be surprised to see this ruling go way right. Not that I'm a fan of that, but it, I would not at all be surprised to see the rights for quote-unquote religious organizations to be extended. Uh, although I, I suspect that generally speaking, it's probably largely going to apply to, to Christian organizations, right? I suspect that legal suits for non-Protestant organizations are less likely to be adjudicated in favor of minority religious groups as they would be for majority religious groups. So, so the other story, so that's one, is that the, the Supreme Court agreed to hear this story or hear this um, case about the making websites. But the other one is a bill that was passed. It, well, it hasn't passed. It's the uh, Virginia House of Delegates this week approved a bill that would excuse certain religious and religious affiliated organizations from following state discrimination laws. That was I was reading the first paragraph of this story. I don't want to be accused of yeah. plagiarism. It has not been signed into law, and I suspect it has other legal challenges before it would possibly get approved. But it looks like there are anti-discrimination laws in Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia, and that this bill is designed to say, hey, if you are a religious group, you are uh, going to be somehow exempt from those non-discrimination laws. Probably, and the, the buzz on online appears to be about permitting religious groups to uh, discriminate against LGBTQ plus um, individuals. I went and looked at the 
the the bill itself, um, which is legal, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure that I fully understand the details of, of the definitions of some of these terms, but they kept using the term religious corporation. And um, I don't know what a religious corporation is, and I want to know, like, legally, who are they counting as a religious corporation? Do they mean churches, or do they mean, like, Hobby Lobby, which is just a corporation that the owner says he is religious, and therefore maybe it gets recognized as a religious corporation? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if they're referring to the, um, that it's, you know, a, a religious nonprofit, like a church in particular or a mosque, or if it means that corporations run by Christians get to be religious corporations now. So I tried to find a definition of religious corporation and couldn't find it in the bill. It's probably, I'm sure, defined somewhere else in Virginia law. But that would be, if if it were any corporation where the owners define themselves as religious, if that's how they're defining it, that would greatly expand the right to discriminate um, in that state. Although, of course, I mean, that could be appealed to the Supreme Court and overturned, but uh, the, the conservatives in the U.S. are using every means available to them through, you know, distributing propaganda, um, uh, filing lawsuits, passing new laws, and identifying themselves as a religious group is a fundamental way of, hey, we have religious th- freedom and we should have the religious freedom to discriminate. I, I don't want to ramble too much longer, but two things that I noticed about the discussion on the particular news story I found. One was that somebody said, let's see, let me see if I can find it. It was specifically that this would expand the rights of religious groups, but they kind of outed themselves by saying this would expand the rights for Christian groups. Oh, and other religious groups. Oh yeah, here it is. This would protect the religious liberty of Christian organizations. Oh, and other faith groups. The fact that they put Christian organizations first tells me a lot about how they're framing this issue, uh, how they're selling it to the public, et cetera, that these are extending rights for Christians. Maybe some Muslims will benefit from this down the line, but it's mostly for Christians. There was something else I was going to point out, but I can't remember it off the top of my head now, so I'll, maybe I'll circle back to that. But yeah, I, this is just more of the same in the U.S. as far as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. two, two new stories of a narrative that's been going on for, for some time now. Well, I was just going to say, I think that for the religious corporation and without doing like a lot more uh, research on it, I think it's in the technical sense, I think it's just a 501c4, which is, so 501c3 is a norm, is a normal nonprofit. And then we have the religious exemption for, for taxation. So I think that the religious corporation in that sense is likely the 501c4, sort of a religious group. But of course, those things are contested too. All the time we find issues with people trying to claim that, for example, Maybe Islam isn't a religion and so therefore doesn't deserve, you know, these types of protection. You know, so we do see even within the debates over religious corporations, whether or not we include Hobby Lobby, there's still plenty of boundary making there. But I'll just mention that. And then uh, Susanna, I don't know if you have I think that what's um, fascinating about these kinds of stories is that they often raise issues about free speech. And I think that's cited in the anti-discrimination one with the business, the website business briefly at towards the end. And I find that what they're trying to say is that like they have the freedom to state something discriminatory. That's what it seems to say. And yet that violates the state, in this case, Colorado's anti-discrimination law in that case. And I think that's why I think, well, obviously, Colorado, you know, it was um, upheld in there, but it's going to Supreme Court, you say, like over and above Colorado. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the Court of Appeals. Yeah. And it has divided the judges over this. So if they were to really apply the law as a way, you know, without bias and without political agendas, then anti-discrimination should be the guideline. You know, is discrimination taking place? The other ones are really secondary. And uh, I heard that about this case in the UK, where this was the outcome that, you know, the discrimination trumped, you know, what came after, because that was where the the actor was discriminating and someone was acted against, which was those who were discriminated. And so that's outside of the issue. It's about the players and their 
um, agency or their action. It did seem like that was the ruling of the the Colorado is, court yeah. was that uh, non discrimination laws trump freedom of religion laws yeah. because the state has an, a legitimate and vested interest in preventing discrimination so that it's okay to override freedom of religion or whatever in, yeah. in that case. But uh, yeah, so I might be maybe, surprised maybe if Supreme that court one go differently. Yeah, I might be surprised if that one goes right you know, towards the right, that would be a, a precedent or something that would muddy the waters even further. The other one with um, exemptions to religious cor- um, corporations, you get this already where they have um, gender discrimination is, you know, they have exceptions for if they're hiring, you know, the Catholic church hiring people, mm-hmm. that they should be male. My um, university is a is Catholic foundation, which is, it's not Catholic, but it's Catholic foundation. They have exemptions for the vice chancellor and chancellor and the chaplain um, that is specified that they are Catholic, but not any other employee. So there's already exemptions there in the Employment Act, you know, that there is discrimination in place there. So you can see how that one can. That's yeah. That's why I thought they were describing religious um, uh, corporation more broadly because those rights for churches to discriminate on the basis of religion is already, already enshrined right. in law in the U.S. Um, so maybe maybe they're pushing back against something that I'm less familiar with. Um, I did want to go back to one of the things that you pointed out, Suzanne, mm. that they're framing um, the the website company is framing this as freedom of speech, and one of the lines says. Colorado has weaponized its law to silence speech it disagrees with. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. Saying that you have to serve gays and lesbians doesn't seem the same as uh, silencing free speech. I mean, I'm sure that those people are legally allowed to say, I don't want to serve you, even as they are legally required to serve you, right? Um, you're not, they're not being told that they cannot express their opinion on the, you know, sinfulness of whatever is going on. They're not silencing them. They're just saying you just have to serve them despite the fact that you don't want to. So it it seems not like it's not about speech at all, uh, unless, uh, because he goes on to say it's it's weaponized its law to silence speech it disagrees with and to compel speech it approves of. Uh, so I guess that if you're making a website and you say congratulations to the happy couple, I guess that that's the the web designer speech instead of the speech of the, I don't know, it seems like if you were making a website for me, uh, Suzanne, you would not take co- uh, responsibility for the content because you're making it for me and it would be understood that it's my content and my speech yeah. that you're putting out there. Yes. Yeah. So either way of framing it in terms of speech doesn't make any sense to me um, w- without really stretching what speech means. Exactly. Well, that's like, I mean, that's an issue with the whole, with Twitter and Facebook right now, right? Like, I, I can't remember the name of the law, but there's literally a law that's like Twitter and Facebook are not required, like they're not responsible for what people say on them um, as a part of, you know, internet um, rulings. And so, I mean, in that way, then you would think, well, if, if that applies to Twitter and Facebook being able to absolve themselves of all the trash that ends up on them, um, (laughs) then you would wonder why it can't be the opposite way of like, especially regarding the, the, um, the internet. Like, so I think actually the fact that this is a case about the internet and websites that actually might be, now that I'm thinking about that might actually be, more distinct than a cake. Like that might be actually getting into some different territory because um, Twitter and Facebook and other social media sites are not as beholden to the things that are put on their platform. Um, so exactly. you can get a little complex. So I just wonder, yeah, because I feel like the internet makes it actually a little bit more tricky um, in terms of, of how you sort of monitor speech. But I hadn't thought about that connection. You should call the Colorado lawyers and <laughs> suggest that. Yeah, they, they owe me 500 bucks for three minutes of thinking. So uh, pay up. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other um, thoughts, Suzanne, on, on these issues about the, the speech and freedom? No, I think um, I would have to look into it more, but it, it is 
um, how it appears to me that the speech is irrelevant in this case. Well, um, until the until the justices decide that it is speech. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I joke with my students, you know, what does the Constitution mean? Uh, it means whatever the Supreme Court today says it means, right? That these things, mm -hmm. because of how uh, rulings can be overturned or reinterpreted, uh, what it means is a moving target. Yeah. Yeah, at least we don't have a constitution in the UK. And not not, that, not, not that kind of constitution anyway. <laughs> yep. Well, um, to pivot to our final um, news story, uh, Suzanne, you had brought up some issues with um, potentially banning hijabs in certain situations in India. So I'd love yeah. to hear more about that and uh, and see and see what's happening across yeah, the world. I this um, has been rumbling for the last month. It's centered in the state of Karnataka in um, southern India. And um, it's the, the government in power in Karnataka is the BJP, which is, um, which is the Nationalist Party. And, and there has been a polarization between the nationalist activism and, um, and I guess, those who oppose um, the kind of hardline nationalist agendas. And it, this is coming towards the end of the school year, and they want to bring in this banning of the hijab in schools quite suddenly, you know. And first of all, there's a question of the timing, you know, that it's still, you know, school is in progress. It's not the beginning of a new term. And um, and this led to uh, a very sort of a protest and, and counter protests, you know. So uh, some of the Muslim students they came in wearing the hijab as a protest. And then some Hindu student, students came in wearing saffron shawls. And saffron is a symbolic um, of nationalist. Well, obviously, saffron means many different things in India, but it's all, it's been sort of co-opted by nationalists for um, Hindutva, sort of national Hinduism. And, and then most recently, just a early, you know, at the weekend, a Hindu activist was, uh, and beaten and killed and apparently he criticized the um, hijab that he was supportive of the state ruling I guess and that there should not be um, they should not be allowed to wear the hijab in school and the idea is that it's a kind of a radical secularism that um, is similar to the model in France where that kind of religious clothing or it's well first of all they've identified the hijab in particular as a kind of religious clothing that should not be worn in the school and as um some of the muslim students have stated you know that they're not mentioning like the turban you know that sikhs might wear they're not mentioning even hindu dress you know covering the armpits and the ankles which is quite normal in for women's attire in um, Hindu traditions. So none of that is targeted. It's the hijab, you know, what is it about that? And the students also ask, you know, what's wrong with being Muslim? So it is targeting Muslims and much in the same way that um, in France, you might argue that this has led to a lot of confusion about what can be worn over the face or around the head. Like, can a helmet be worn? But no, it's specifically the hijab. But they're trying to put it in words in a way that's meant like it sounds like it's not about Islam, but it is. And that's who is affected. And, and so it is this interesting issue about a piece of clothing that may or may not be categorized as religious, you know, I suppose. Um, but it is clearly targeting one particular segment of society, and not only that, they're women. And I wonder if that makes a difference as well. It's never stated, the gender issue, but one of the BBC um, articles about this highlighted the, the, the headline was about Muslims not being oppressed, Muslim women. Wearing a hijab doesn't make a Muslim woman oppressed. Um, and so one of the women who was spoken to she was saying that to choose to wear hijab or not to wear hijabs i'm still muslim you know whether i'm wearing one or not um and so the hijab itself is not oppressing her you know um so that's quite interesting as well so 
Um, but I mean, the death of the individual is, of course, a, a horrible thing to happen, no matter what side of the controversy that they positioned themselves. And it was a Facebook post, I believe, that he did. He did a couple of posts. Mm-hmm. One was about the saffron wave, which may have sort of irritated some people, but I think it's when he criticized uh, the people who are supporting the wearing of the hijab. So he said no to the hijab. And well, in any case, enough. He um, he was outspoken enough and became a target, and he was killed, which is really lamentable. Yeah, that's sad. Um, I, I'm curious, Suzanne, if you know more about because I, I read the article that you forwarded, and it didn't talk much about the rationale that's being offered for the banning. Um, is could. Because like you pointed out, right, if if the rationale is that they're banning religious icons or something, it seems like that would also exclude Sikh, Sikh turbans, Sikh turbans. Mm-hmm. Um, so do they have a clever rationale that somehow picks out hijabs while pretending not just to pick out hijabs? Yeah. The one I found that seemed to be the clearest is from the Hindustan Times. And it states that uh, a senior party leader said that a Congress said that um, – the state has been influenced, I guess, by the Saffron Party. And the stand of their stand is that, and this is quoting, religion will be kept outside the classrooms. It has brought, and that this has brought several, um, has helped to consolidate the vote bank in that region for the Saffron Party. So, so it's, it seems to be, so uh, they, it's they, they, may, they may not have a way to justify it. Yet, or it's actually being heard. The case is still it. ongoing right now, so it's being heard at the very moment. I mean, I can't remember if it was um, Quebec or France Quebec, that at yeah. one point they said they were banning um, religious icons, mm. but they excluded small crosses. They were like, if it's a small cross, it doesn't count as a religious icon. So I guess Christians can wear small crosses, mm. Mm. but all the other ones, I guess, are are not viewed as nondescript because they, they're not part of the, the common Christian um, monopoly. Yeah, that was... Uh, uh, yeah, can, that. Let's just say consistency doesn't have to be a feature of these rules. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. It's, it always looks like that they're trying to find a case to support a particular agenda, and uh, whether it's um, to discriminate against LGBT rights mm-hmm. um, plus or if it's to discriminate against Muslims, that they'll invent a kind of a ruling in order to try, try to kind of limit um, those groups. But then, of course, it opens the can of rooms, you know, because you have to then start making exceptions, mm-hmm. uh, and then it gets ridiculous. Yeah, the thing I was going to mention there is that, um, so something I work on in my in my classes and quite a bit of, um, and a bit of reading on it, uh, has to do with the gendered notions of Islamophobia that often get mapped onto women more than men, um, because of the visibility of the hijab. Um, of course there are, uh, head coverings that some Muslim men use, um, across the world, but those tend to be more, um, localized. And so if they're popular in the region that you live in, then perhaps, um, many men wear them otherwise, maybe not. Um, but the hijab, often gets to be this stand-in because of its visibility. Um, and actually, it's curious that you mentioned, you know, that in the in this South Indian state that specifically, you know, Sikh turbans are not um, connected because um, an article that I've taught recently and been thinking about quite a bit um, is called like Muslim, Muslimophobia in kind of post 9-11 time. And it's by um, Simran Jeet Singh, who's a major um, you know, Sikh figure, public figure. Um, and he writes about actually the shared issues between um, Muslims and Sikhs, at least in the United States, of um, conf- not just confused identity, but sort of focused on these um, symbols of visibility between the hijab and the Sikh turban as markers of identity, even though, um, you know, one is obviously a different religion than the other, but the the conflation of them as sort of a shared angst against the figure of the Muslim, um, as opposed to hating Islam. Um, and so they use the term Muslimophobia instead of 
Islamophobia because it's not really a phobia of the religion, but rather what that person represents, which is interesting. Um, but in any case, it's it's curious because, um, yeah, we've seen sort of that conflation more in the United States of like, oh, that person has this head covering. Um, and so it's, it's interesting that in this Indian case that you're talking about, it's really just the hijab. But no matter what, um, gender does play a part and the, um, and, and women do often face a stronger, um, brunt of Islamophobia because of that visibility. Um, so lots of issues there. Yes. We interesting to see how, um, what the state court rules, um, is in progress at the moment, but it appears to be against headscarves. Um, and, um, and then it's targeted the hijab in particular. Yeah. In in the BBC article you um, forwarded, that's the one I read, the BBC article, Suzanne, mm -hmm. um, and it focused on um, the first person experience of Muslim women who were like, I don't have to wear this. I choose to wear this. Um, I was, it made me think like, so it, I think in the U.S., if you were trying to defend your right to wear the hijab, you might use religious freedom. But if you said it's just my choice the court might say, well, if it's not, if it's just your individual arbitrary choice, then it doesn't reflect the man's religion, in which case you don't, you don't have exemption. to wear it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like they might say, well, here's your religion requiring things. This is just your individual choice. That's um, a good point. That it, it could be, it could lose protection because you can't um, yeah. justify it with a, because a, you can, appeal to the at least in the U S context. Um, you can say that it's my religious freedom to wear a scarf, but if you say that it's my choice, then you don't have that protection. And so to say it's like, um, like I want to wear um, a Wookiee outfit when I go to school, you know, from Star Wars, um, that's my choice. But um, if they say they want to ban, you know, full body costumes, you know, where you can't see who's inside, um, then that I don't have any rights to um, insist that I wear that outfit. Um, so that's what it could, yeah, so in some ways they could be actually be minimizing their rights by um, not uh, framing it, framing that, it way. that way. Yeah. I, I was only thinking yeah. about that because I, I teach um, Sol uh, Winifred Sullivan's book, The Impossibility of Religious Freedom, about a particular case where the judge ruled mm -hmm. That's not your religion. That's your individual choice, and therefore, it's not not protected. Um, yeah. So, reading that article made me think of that. Yeah, and there was um, a case in Britain about uh, someone wearing um, a hooded robe in a supermarket, and he was told to take it down or something. But he stated his religious freedom as a Jedi or something along those lines. It was quite a number of years ago, but it did sort of open that debate about you know, is it a religious item? But, you know, this is happens with the category of religion and law is always doing this. Um, it's it's always trying to do one thing and then it ends up having to do another thing. And it's um, it's just created this can of worms whenever you have that. And and with um, uh, belief added to it in um, Europe and in the UK, where it's religion or belief, that's made it even more, you know, with, um, yeah, you know, some more sort of cases, you know, it's just going to be a lawyer's dream, you know, trying to decide what's a belief, you know, what's a genuine belief as opposed to any other belief or opinion. That might actually be, we're, we're getting on our time. Um, and that might actually be a good kind of summation there of, of just religion and law. Blah. <laughs> I feel like that's my, <laughs> that's my summary now. But um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, and I think that's something that we're always doing. The Religious Studies Project is thinking about these boundary makings. Who who gets to decide what symbols matter? Who gets to decide um, what is religion in the eyes of the law? Who gets to decide what rights are when we're, you know, messing with religious, um, uh, you know, sort of dominance and, and power. Um, and so I think definitely all the articles that we sort of brought up today 
deal with that in a lot of um, diverse ways. So I really thank you both for your um, thoughtfulness and your um, you. You know, concern about these issues. It was great to chat with you all. And I hope we see you all both um, just on other contributions to the Religious Studies Project. Um, and definitely, if you've been tuned in, let us know what you think on social media and comment, uh, and comment share everything. Um, but thank you all so much for listening. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews. Video editing by Alison Isidore. Podcast transcription by Jaden Bartashius. And social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com backslash project rs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes and all other portals. Thanks for listening.